Tommy, it is a pleasure to have you in two dimensions in front of me. How are you? Good, mate. Very good. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's, I know it is two dimensions, isn't it? It's um, what a weird world we live in. Yeah, we've been trying, to, despite the, the 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 city of Melbourne and the world opening up, we've been trying to touch and feel each other for a number <laughs> of weeks now, and uh, it's proved challenging. So we thought, stick to what we know, which is <laughs> Zoom, right? Totally, totally. Yeah, but we've got a, we've got a coffee organised for this Friday, my friend. So it's going to happen. Very exciting. And, um, you know, in amongst our um, two-dimensional conversations, we were really, uh, you know, workshopping some great ideas and one of them being um, to um, put together a little bit of a, um, you know, some teamwork and uh, to be able to bring our minds together, no pun intended, being the Mind Mate podcast and um, being able to join forces and uh, really just kind of flesh out exactly what we think about on a daily basis and see how we can um, essentially just vomit pearls of wisdom out, if we can, to uh, people for people to listen to, right? Mate, uh, absolutely. You know, I mean, for, for um, just for a bit of context, you know, Paul and I used to work together um, um, coaching CrossFit, you were predominantly a personal trainer. I don't think you took classes. Um, uh, yeah, I used to take classes to. quite a bit. I actually used to uh, run that facility before uh, oh, right. before Ezra came on on board. In between uh, owners and managers, I was I was running that facility. But uh, yeah, predominantly a personal trainer and health coach. And I've been in the industry for now twenty years. Yeah, mate, twenty years. Yeah, shit. Yeah, I, was, I was born about twenty years ago. <laughs> Correct. So I'm not actually a veteran. I'm a dinosaur. Yeah. Paul's actually my father. <laughs> yeah. No joke. No, that's, okay. right. that's right. Yeah, but we, we met, um, so that would have been, what, 2017, I think it was, late 2017, and just, you know, hit it off straight away. You know, I think you and I were always destined to be um, um, good good mates, and uh, we just had so much to talk about, you know, from 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 the very beginning, from the gen- genesis of our friendship and uh you you had a podcast um at that time yes yes i did um yeah it, it was called my wellness wish list and uh i'm actually working on reformatting a lot of those interviews to oh, nice. be able to reappropriate it for the hero life podcast so i can basically give the the audience that currently listens to um to us uh, the takeaways that i had with the 100 plus guests that i had including um wim hoff and a, a whole bunch of other other guests and there's tremendous crossover given that you've also had a past podcast where you've been able to interview some uh, tremendous guests with in- incredible minds yeah well i mean that that's part of the thing isn't it man like we i think because i was doing that podcast at the time and yeah just you're exactly right. There was so much crossover within our own experiences and therefore our own kind of ideas, our perspectives, the way we see the world, um, what we kind of want to give to the world is our own kind of personal gift reflected in our work, which I think led to um, some of these conversations. But uh, yeah, it's uh, so so we, we would speak all the time. We spoke a lot about um, spirituality, psychology, personal development um, and I, I kind of stumbled upon, I'd seen, because we would speak every once in a while and I, I saw the stuff you were doing with, with Hero, you know, with, with helping parents. And to me, that, that really spoke to me. Um, you know, I see a lot of parents in the clinic that I work in as well. And there are these almost two separate kind of paradigms of dysfunction that, I'm, that I was noticing for, for men and women. That was one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to pick your brain on this sort of stuff and mm. see where we could come together um, to, to, to riff about it. Um, I was noticing that a lot of men were kind of, um, self-sacrificing their own visions and ideals, um, as kind of like a, a negative 180 swing moving away from the also negative tyrannical aspect of, well, I'm just going to work all day and then you stay home with the kids sort of thing. Um, now there's almost too much of that. And like, I don't know who I am anymore. And I feel like there's got to be some sort of ethical selfishness associated with that. And then for women as well, you know, I'm sure there's a Sarah Jessica Parker film about this, but this kind of like archetypal um, idealizing of the, of the boss mum, you know, who can do it all and no one can fucking do it all, you know? And, and, and why would you want to do it all? You know, you, you'd want to have, you'd want to enjoy your life. And I think 
I mean, the global disorder that we're all facing is is doing too much, you know. But I'm sure you're noticing um, that in some of the work you do. But yeah, in general, mate, just just so much for you and I to talk about. And what better way to just to do that than to produce some content? Yeah, I, I agree, and it's it's interesting that our genesis come from you know working uh, the human body, something that I still have a, a tremendous passion for. And I feel like, you know, being in this industry for so long, um, you know, people really go go a couple of different ways. They either, like, tr- drill down and really specialise heavily into um, human function and the, the biomechanics, et cetera, um, or they, they begin to um, really explore uh, that mind-body connection and then delve further into the mind and I feel like we, we, we really have a commonality there and being able to uh, explore that and, mm. you know, uh, going along with the theme of what you were discussing when it comes to transitioning to parenthood, I feel like there is a definite perceived, um, th- th- there's a commonality that a lot of uh, uh, people that, uh, mothers and fathers alike that I deal with, where there's that perception of um, loss when they transition mm. into parenthood. And that can be a really, really um, difficult time a beautiful time as well because, you know, uh, an entirely new human being is born from from you and your partner and it's it's wonderful and it's scary and it's threatening and it's, um, it's magical all at the same time. So you're getting all these conflicting emotions and feelings and you think you need to be feeling um, overjoyed 100% of the time and you feel guilty for not feeling overjoyed 100% of the time. But ultimately, it's hard. It's bloody hard. Um, but wrapped up in all of that is so much reward, you know. Um, but the, the theme that I do see is this self-sacrifice that, uh, that, that takes place and that can be a really uh, challenging thing because one day um, people in, who have transitioned into that parenthood wake up and they're like, I don't even know who I am anymore. Mm. You know, I, I've lost my sense of identity and I've seen that so many times. So to have a healthy relationship with yourself during this process can be an incredibly uh, rewarding experience and not only a rewarding experience for you, but you get to be able to teach your children and your children's children generationally how to be able to do this and be a really, really healthy role model if, you know, taken with awareness and acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, like, I'm really excited um, for our, for our conversations. So, so I think to give some people some, some, some background here, our plan is a little bit ambiguous at this stage, but w- we certainly know that there are conversations to be had, um, which I think are going to be, will result in uh, much more frequent catch ups um, together to, to discuss these ideas. And, and we were talking about, you know, business collaborations and, and, and so forth. And I think we're excited by that, but I think it's, it's all going to be generated from the podcast to see, to see what happens here. But to, to kick things off straight away, you know, you mentioned something there about losing yourself, um, you know, by definition, as a result of self-sacrifice coming into parenthood. Mm-hmm. And, um, that, that, that really kind of sparked my interest because, uh, one of the areas that I, love to deal with most in psychology is existentialism and what is the self, you know, and, and I hear that a lot. I don't know who I am. And I, I've come to believe that you, you find yourself by looking forwards because your identity um, is, is something that's, it's very uh, um, volatile, but it, 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 it manifests as a result of your actions across time. So we, we were talking about jujitsu just before the podcast and right now, like, you know, potentially 3% of my identity has shifted to the degree that I now am someone that does jujitsu. Whereas prior to getting my white belt, I wasn't that person. So my identity is a whole bunch of things put together to make this costume. And what's, this is the paradox of life when you go through major existential change, like becoming a parent, is that it is both terrifying and life regenerating. And what I mean by life regenerating is that a new life is generating. Mm -hmm. You know, you are a phoenix that emerges from the ashes, but that doesn't mean you have to completely dispense with everything that you had prior to parenthood. You know, there are some parts that you, about that old identity that you 
might really still want to do. And it's about bringing that on and perhaps, you know, redefining your identity based upon new goals that are, you know, that, that are applicable to this identity of being a, uh, being a parent. The final thing I'll say here is there was a really interesting um, piece of work done by two um, psych authors in 1997, Nessie and Williams. So I've cited this a whole bunch of times because it's one of my favorite um, um, things to talk about with people that have, you know, persistent depression. Most psychologists, they said, found that depression tended to lift when people let go of these goals that had been defining them for many, many years. And what that tells me is that depression is kind of like a personal grievance. It's like, I'm still attached to this goal that I know will never be accomplished. I wanted to be a this, I wanted to be a that. I wish, you know, you can see how so much of that is associated with parenthood. Well, mm. I have all, I can't never do this anymore. Who do I want to be? And it's about grieving this old self so that this new self can emerge. Mm, it's uh, fascinating and this all resonates so heavily into the world that I am uh, really, really um, heavily, you know, kind of um, placed in right now and this whole sense of carving out your own identity and having the power to be able to carve out, carve out your future and present identity is uh, such a powerful thing that, that everybody has the power to be able to do. And then it gets reversed engineered back into, and I'm big on coaching a lot of my, my mothers and fathers through creating change through habits yeah. and being able to create shift through habits. But I strongly believe that habits will not be adhered to on a consistent manner if you don't take full ownership of this identity that you want to be able to step into. Yeah. That is the driving force. It's this, this identity that you can really, really uh, step into. And, you know, like the world is your stage, you know, you have the ability to be able to shift into whatever, whatever identity you want to do. And the second thing uh, I, I want to mention is that, that that's particularly um, relevant uh, to my life and amongst conversations I've been having with friends in my position right now is the, the absence of, rituals and things that give us that gave us joy and that may still give us joy and you know I, i've been kind of specifically um uh, reaching for certain things um that that have really activated that joy for me recently like i was just saying before we press record i i went footy training on the week yeah and <laughs> Buzz, I guess I'm a 40 year old old man <laughs> by, by, by football standards, right? <laughs> um, I feel great. And I, 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 but the point of the reason I bring this up is because when I was out on that training track, I felt alive, mm. like electric, and it gave me 100% unbridled joy. I thought I was going to lose a lung, but. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it was coupled with unbridled absolute joy and uh, and that feeling has actually it's it's now tuesday afternoon and it's maintained since sunday afternoon mm -hmm. and it's elevated my my presence and my my status within myself for such a period of time mm -hmm. that uh it's undeniable like i want to keep doing more of that until I, I lose a leg or something. <laughs> yeah, actually lose a lung. <laughs> or, or actually lose, lose a lung. Exactly right. So um, doing things that, that, that give you joy, um, tapping into those, th those deep wells that can actually give you these types of things or simply just, you know, being able to um, – uh, trace back to, to things that used to give you joy. They may not give you joy anymore, but they might also all the, all the same. Mm. Yeah, that, that's so true, isn't it? So, so what, um, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to play devil's advocate with someone who might be hearing that and going, you know, I've heard that before, you know, it's just, it's sure, you know, I just got to do things that make me happy. But, but then, so what, what are some objections to that idea? Mm -hmm. If, if you face, if you faced any. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, when you're deep in the baby cave, I, like let, let's look at um, my, you know being a, a father, a parent. Sure, yeah. When you're deep in the baby cave, you're like, yeah, sure, okay, I'm going to go piss off for 
five hours and play a game of footy, head down the pub with my mates while the missus is back you know, <laughs> <laughs> looking, up, looking after. Sounds like a great life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, but it, it, it may not be, you know, it may not be available at this very point in time. And, it, and if it is available, it may not look like an entire afternoon. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I've dealt with clients in the past where I've asked them, what makes you feel free the most? Mm. And uh, I'll just reference a conversation that I had with a, with a client not so long ago. And, and he's like, you know, being in rural Canada, this guy's from America, in, in the wilderness in America or Canada and just being off, you know, off charts, off, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, off, off the grid. Yes. Off the grid. Off the grid for like a week or two, and I'm like, great, that that's awesome. Now, you probably can't do that every week, sure. <laughs> but how can you achieve that feeling? Because we're not after actually going to America; we're after the feeling that you get yes. when you go off grid in the states. How can you achieve that feeling, but in another environment? Mm. Is it going taking? You know, is it going? Um, once a month to the Dandenongs and uh, going hiking there or the Yuyangs and then back for, you know, doing a, I don't know, a four or five hour round trip and and then uh, finding yourself back home. That seems a lot more accessible and you get a taste of, um, you know, of, of what it's like. Are you familiar with the um, strength and conditioning um, dude, Paolo Tutsulan? No. So he's, he's a dude uh, and... <laughs> He's got a great name. Yes. Uh, and he has a concept called greasing the groove. And uh, the concept basically comes from, let's say, you, you, you know, you're, you're looking at being able to um, achieve a 200 kilogram deadlift. Yeah. The idea of being able to just every couple of hours pick up a uh, 100 kilo bar and just grease the groove, being able to recruit the muscles um, in a much less, uh, you know, in, in the same range of motion, but less um, load, sure. essentially. Um, uh, let's attribute that to your own lifestyle and your yep. mind, you know. Do you see the delineation there? Um, the 200 kilo deadlift bar might be um, being off grid in the wilderness in the United States somewhere in, uh, I, I don't know, Joshua Tree or something like that. But the 100 kilo greasing the groove might aspect, aspect might be going uh, to the Yu Yangs and being mm. back for dinner. Yep. Yep. That's a great point. It's, uh, yeah, that that is exactly right, isn't it? And you, you often find something that you were, um, you were, uh, you made mention of this idea of like, you can't be that free. It can't be a week, um, mm -hmm. but um, it can be something. And one of the, one of the things that I, that I, that I like, I like this idea of like playing into or, or being curious about what the greener grass is and then finding a healthy balance there. Cause if you get, if you're, I mean, all mental dysfunction is basically just rigid thinking, being unable to, let go of whatever this thing is, if it's sadness and tears or anger or some sort of intrusive thought, you know, it's very easy for us to conceptualize greener grass. So I just wish I could, you know, or the classic question, well, if you had a magic wand, what would, what would it look like? What would life look like for you? Mm -hmm. How, how would your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend be different? What would they be, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I just wish they did this, or I just wish my life was like this, or, you know, cause you're exactly right. We're chasing a feeling, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you know, you know, this neurochemistry has been around for 210 million years, you know, mm -hmm. mammals are very, very old mm -hmm. cars and porn and food and shopping. That's all new stuff, but it's the same neurochemistry, Absolutely. but sometimes just thinking about the greener grass and then finding a healthy balance between your actual situation and what you want can be enough. Absolutely. And you, you talk about this greener grass, you know, is the grass greener on the other side or is the grass greener where you water it? Right. And, and how do you water it? You mm. know, like, um, can you water, can, can, can you water the concept and that feeling of freedom by simply journaling about it? Right. By closing your eyes and meditating on it, by having, 
a, an incredibly emotive, in-depth conversation with your partner about, you know, planning a trip yes. at, at some stage and just getting excited together for the concept, you know. There are so many ways that you can elicit that do- dopamine response within your body. Um, like you said, where we're creatures that have evolved over millennia, like multiple, multiple hundreds of millions of years. So to think that we only have one way, all we're after is creating that, that, that chemical response within our, our body, right? Yeah. How can we do that without jumping on a plane and taking a month out of our lives? And there's nothing wrong with doing that if it's possible, you know? Like, yes. I think that's great, but like, let's, let's be practical as well. Yes. Yeah. And I, you know, also think about sustainability as well. You know, um, one variation of your identity, you know, to bring it back to parenthood and I, I'm not a, I'm not a father yet, but you know, one aspect of your identity probably really likes being a parent, you know, there's like a psychoanalytic idea. There's all these other forces in you that want all these other things, but one of them, that's a fair stakeholder. <laughs> they got a major share of the company here. Yeah. They, they like being a parent. So if you can balance all, out all these other forces, um, it's, uh, I mean, it, I, potentially it's easier said than done, but ask for help, use strategies, you know, um, <clears throat> you can already see how these conversations are going to, are going to play uh, out. I think that could be good. I, I love it. And I love where you're going with that as well, because as we mentioned before, you're, you're dealing with this sense of, of loss of mm. time, independence. Um, ability to be able to piss off to the other side of the world. But in the same breath, you've gained so much. You've, yes. you've been able to, uh, you, you, every moment you're at home or you're in the presence of your children, you get to role model and you get to mould the mind of a, of a young one uh, to be able to create um, practices that, that that can inspire. And that's an incredible gift and privilege to be able to do. And, you know, like, you don't, you, you'll bugger it up from time, uh, many times over as well. But, like, that's all part of the fun as well. So mm-hmm. with loss comes gain and and, and gifts. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's a hell of a journey. That's for sure. That's for sure. You know, that, that is a really great point, I think, with, with loss comes gain. I think we have a real tendency to perhaps pedestal um, being free. You know, we, we might even look back on, on our past of partying in our early 20s, like teens, no responsibilities. It's like, well, well, that was the good life. You know, now I've got all these responsibilities and I have to go to work and, you know, it's downhill from near, from here. But... The other, I mean, you know, the negative side to having a life without responsibilities is that there's no kind of uh, meaning or purpose associated with that. No, you know, responsibility is wonderfully, you know, you wake up every day and you have people that rely on you or you've, perhaps you've got some kind of major position at work or you're doing something that's really important to you. Sure. There's responsibility and discipline and a whole lot of stress Mm. associated with that, but at least you're a someone doing something as opposed to being a young kid who's essentially a nobody doing anything. And I don't, you know, I don't mean to sound harsh because, you know, I see a lot of young people, but it's a time of pure um, potential, yep. you know, but potential is like a, um, it's, it's, it's dormant. It's like a volcano that hasn't erupted yet. You know, it could be anything, but it's actually not anything yet. Yeah. Which, which means it could be, which, which means it could be anything and everything. Exactly. Uh, and it's beautiful. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll let you finish your thought. No, no, no. You're exactly, exactly. And it is it is exciting to be in that phase because there's youth associated with that. There's the rest of your life, you know, um, ahead of you. Like, who do you want to be? What do you want to do? It's so exciting. But there's a lot of uh, struggle because of the availability of choice with that. You yeah. know, the classic analogy is the Netflix scenario. You know, how hard is it to pick a movie <laughs> it's impossible you know, uh, because there's so many options and and do you remember and this is another really really uh, like i romanticized about this so much some when something comes on network tv right <laughs> like a, an old like like a tv sh- like a movie from the 2000s or the 90s and you're like oh my god 
I don't know. Home Alone 2 is on. I've, yep. got to, I've got to watch this. Like it's at, on an 8.30 on Saturday night. I'm staying home and I'm watching it. I still do that. Like yes. when it's on network TV because it's on. I know I know I can access it on Netflix <laughs> or, 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 you know, in my logical mind. But it's like this romance of it being uh, there and available. But like if yep. it. <clears throat> but I've never watched it on uh, on Netflix because we do have so much choice and we're spoiled for choice and we can't sit down and, and, and go through a, a series because, you know, we don't give it a chance and that can be yes. uh, like like a real metaphor for, for life because we yep. have so like this abundance of things that are so available to us. We don't just invest in one path fully, you know? It's, it's so true. I mean, you know, people even, you know, myself included, you know, I'm a human being and, you know, sometimes it's even hard to get through an entire movie on Netflix, you know, but at least with watching a movie on, uh, on network TV, as you say, with ads in the middle of it, it creates that kind of like open loop anticipation for the next scene, you know, and too much of a good thing, as you said before, in a world filled with pleasure, I read, I got this from reading, um, Brave New World, um, the guy who wrote the intro to that said, in a world where everything is available, nothing has any meaning, mm. you know, very, very interesting metaphor for kind of what we're living through right yep. now, you know, yep. and yep. rise to things called dopamine detoxes and all sorts of fun, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> internet things. Uh, yeah, you're spot on. And I think, you know, for, you know, you mentioned that we're, uh, you know, this whole grass is greener thing and where, you know, we're designed to, to think, like our, our brains and our bodies are designed to think about the worst case scenario. Yep. We're not designed to be happy. We're designed to survive. Yes. And survival is thinking about surviving threats. And we're always designed, like, like up until how long ago? What, 200 years ago, um, there were real threats that were going to, you know, kind of, kill us and our families and uh, I feel like, you know, within us we're designed to be able to, uh, need, like, to be on high alert to be able to do this. So, you know, to be able to hack that system is going to be take some time and it's going to take a lot of effort to be able to do. We've definitely gone on tangents, but I love it. <laughs> well, this is, this is all part of it, you know. I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, – no, but you're, you're exactly right. I mean, just to, to play off that a little bit, you know, I think, um, you know, they say often – um, this is certainly true from a neurochemical perspective is that progress is, is the ultimate sense of fulfillment. You know, how do you kind of push out progress so that it becomes this, you know, thing that you're working on for the rest of your life. But you certainly, we all know this, you know, you, you're feeling okay. There's a bit of a struggle there, but it's, it's kind of the perfect mechanism for flow. Um, when you're studying and you're studying and then you do your exam and you feel happy because that's where you feel the most serotonin, everything is good as it, as it is. Yeah. And then five minutes later, there's like a new mountain that needs to be climbed. Oh, well, I'm hungry. Oh, I should be doing this. And, you know, so it's yeah. uh, <clears throat> that sense of progress that I, that I think we, we want the most. And the interesting thing I think um, and you and I, so I remember you and I spoke extensively about Viktor Frankl when we used to hang out together. Yes. And he said that what's so good about, you know, a struggle in life, and he was the psychiatrist, I think he was, but he, he, he developed logotherapy, logotherapy. probably the, the most influential 20th century psych. I, I reckon a lot of people would say that. He was certainly incredible. Survived Auschwitz, I think it was, in the Holocaust. Certainly was at a camp. I'm pretty sure it was Auschwitz. Auschwitz, um, yeah. Yep. He was writing The Doctor and the Soul in there. He said that was his purpose, to stay alive, you know. Um and, um, and he also wrote Man's Search for Meaning. But um, one of the things he speaks about is how responsibility and struggle kind of pulls you back so it makes it harder to achieve your goal, therefore more worthwhile fulfilling when you do achieve it, mm. you know. And there are so many interesting different ways that people basically say the same thing. I remember reading um, Stephen King's memoir, you know, and he's written – what, 40, 50 plus books, including short stories and, and all sorts of stuff. And yeah. um, the vast majority of them have been made into movies, you know, incredible, probably the, one of the greatest writers. And um, he, there was a part in the book where he was talking about how every writer, and this spoke to me, <laughs> every writer loves this idea of being in a cabin in the middle of the woods with like a butler who makes you all your food and you've got all the time to write. Right. But he said, <coughs> 
when, when he thought about it, having kids and having responsibilities actually led to him writing more because it made it so much more challenging yet fulfilling to do it. So he was carving out hours that he probably wouldn't have done if he had all the time in the world. So interesting stuff. It is. And uh, I feel like those, those perceived barriers that come up um, within your life, they're stimulus for you to create um, like their adversity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think science is, is showing us that humans thrive uh, in adversity. What, if we get too comfortable, it, as well as from, uh, you know, not, not just a mental perspective, but a, a biological perspective, if we were not, if, if we were not to go through these stages of hormosis for, uh, to be able to, um, you know, get past these discomfort levels, we're not going to evolve. We're not going to, you know, if we, <laughs> you know, species that got too comfortable just died. Yes. Right? Uh, that you know, people in species that would have metaphorical butlers in in cabins <laughs> would would not be around for very long. You know, the yes. butlers would probably survive. True, the butlers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very true. Well, so so, what are some of your um, goals and um, ideas about where these conversations will take us, mate? Well, I think um, this has been a really great start because we've just kind of um, spoken a little bit about you know, uh, commonality being, being able to help, um, you know, parents, but I feel like we can, uh, and then we've gone on a number of different tangents, which I love. Yes. Um, and we've just talk, talked about the meaning of life, which I yes. also love. Um, <laughs> straight into it. Uh, yeah. Well, straight for the jugular. And, um, I think, I think it'd be great to be able to just kind of, um, come up with some themes that, um, interest us, that interest uh, the audience as well. I think uh, I, I, it would be great to be able to throw uh, some questions out to the audience as well and yeah. ask ask you guys, what do you want to hear from us? Um, uh, what kind of conversations would you like to get our, our insights from and what questions would you like to, to be asked? Because um, we're, we're ultimately after being able to satisfy or to be able to, I suppose, elicit conversation, not just between us through um, this two-dimensional mental masturbation, but, uh, <laughs> but to, to be, be able That's to... Good. Have, <laughs> to be able to um, have conversations with you guys as well. So, um, yeah, that's, that, that's, they're my thoughts. Definitely. Yeah, no, I've... Uh, I think for a long time, I think you said uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were having a chat, um, the, you know, the podcast world, entrepreneurial world in itself can be a lonely thing sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to, it's fun to do solo shows every now and then. It's also fun to really do things and build things, um, with, with friends. Agreed. You know? Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm really excited about it, mate. I think, um, we'll just have to see where it takes us. I, I completely agree. And, uh, you know, we, we can go down the, uh, the mental path, we can go down the physical path, the fact that you're just exploring this uh, physical expression of, of yourself. And I know you, you know, when you left personal training um, a number of years ago, you found yourself kind of inactive for a yep. period of time. And it took the context of martial arts and um, being able to engage in, in this form of training for you to find that passion again. And since yeah. then, you've re-engaged in, in, in strength training, et cetera. But, like, I feel like the instigator, the impetus was engaging in the, the dance of, uh, of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Mate, that, <clears throat> that, that is something that I would love to, to talk about more uh, for sure. You know, you're exactly right. I, I was... Um, uh, you know, I identified as a CrossFit athlete, you know, one year I did really well in the CrossFit Open. I was <clears throat> training for many hours a day and that was who I was. And then when I started to have this nudge and this pull to, you know, um, start exploring the inner landscape, uh, it took me by storm and I became obsessed with it, you know. And I think now having found jujitsu, what I've really noticed is that jujitsu um, kind of attracts weirdos <laughs> and I, I love weirdos, <laughs> but, yeah. um, they're, they're not necessarily, you might, you know, look, you might, one in 20 people might do jujitsu because they actually want to learn how to fight. And that's great. You know, I, yeah. I, I believe anyway, that if you really know how to fight, you're actually less of a threat, you know, I, 
because I feel like a lot of bullying comes from insecurity. So, Absolutely. you know, that old expression, better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Mm. <coughs> it's a very thing. I'm just getting over a cold, guys. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, for me, it was a real, it was a, it was a way to physically learn about myself, you know, and I do jujitsu because it teaches me about my relationship with fear because there's lots of moments when you uh, get very claustrophobic when mm. someone's holding you down, you know, that's the perfect um, prerequisite for not only a fight or flight threat response, but also a freeze response mm. because you can't fight or flight because they're better than you and mm. they're holding you down mm. because they're in a better position. So what do you do? You know, and I've, you know, learning about, you know, breathing and the autonomic nervous system. And that's played a major role in, in helping clients with anxiety because so much anxiety, you know, you and I could talk for days about CBT and these kind of <coughs> evidence-based based methods that, you know, let, let's, let's kind of dispel your thoughts and, you know, and bring them back to their kind of traumatic root cause. But at the end of the day, you wouldn't be in that kind of heightened state if your breathing was regular. Mm. So why don't we focus more on the exhale to do the opposite of the parasympathetic and we'll see what happens there. But yeah. jiu-jitsu is just phenomenal for that introspection. Yeah. And, and that's that bottom up, top down um, philosophy that we can we can definitely explore in, in future episodes, you know, being able to understand that you can't divide your body and your mind, yes. you know, and yes. you have options abundant to be able to, uh, to use your example, alleviate stress and anxiety. You can use your body's deeply evolved technology and mechanisms to be able to elicit a response in your mind uh, and your mood. And um, people don't necessarily think about it that way, but yep. um, opportunities are abundant to be able to uh, cultivate um, a mood and disposition and um, a mental process that you want to be able to achieve. Yeah, it, it, it's so true. You know, <clears throat> I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, what you and I are both so excited about <clears throat> where this might take us. Yeah, I think um, just with your background, extensive knowledge of the body, you know, and then how that plays into mental health and then loops back into, to, to, well, health in general, I think is something uh, that's going to be so, so fun exploring. But, man, I think the fact that I can't stop coughing is probably a good sign to yeah, we'll, call off the welcome episode. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wind this up. But that's that's been great, really, really good. And uh, looking forward to the next episode. We'll uh, we'll get together and uh, maybe pose some questions out to our individual communities and um, see what types of, um, you know, kind of questions come up and maybe that can guide us for future episodes. But really pumped for this, Tommy boy. Yeah, yeah, no, it'll be great, mate. And uh, yeah, like we said in the beginning, any chance to catch up again um, is uh, is always going to be good too. So, one hundred percent. That's going cool. Be. All, All right, right, guys. Well, yeah, great to chat, Paulie. Great to chat. Great to chat with you, Tom. And thank you so much for listening, guys, and taking the time. And once again, um, you know, w we have um, podcasts individually that. Our objective is to be able to get them to as many listeners as possible. So it would be so great if you guys could listen, review, like, all the rest of it with both um, the Mind Made podcast and the Hero Life podcast because this is stuff that we do and we know, and it makes a difference when you guys, um, you know, engage in and write a review uh, um, to it because it just gives us the opportunity to be able to send our voice out to more and more people. Totally. It's so true. Yeah. We'll uh, see where it goes. Awesome, Tom. Cool.